Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Oscar Reveling, Education Manager at the Wilsonian Florida International University. Thank you all for tuning in to our special program, Blair Architecture Villainry, um, presented in partnership with the Miami Center for Architecture and Design, AIA Miami, and FIU's Miami Beach Urban Studios. We're gathered here to delve more closely into Lair, radical homes and hideouts of movie villains, a text that, as the title suggests, explores architecture and cinema, but will expand the conversation to include the notion of an architecture of persuasion, reflecting the expansive visions of these notorious individuals. I'm pleased to be joined today by Chad Oppenheim, architect and co-author of Lair, Silvia Barisione, Wilsonian curator, and John Stewart, executive director of Miami Beach Urban Studios, who will be moderating today's conversation. As our program develops, we encourage you all to submit your questions through the Q&A feature. And to those of us joining us through Facebook Live, we'll be monitoring the chat as well. So please make sure to send your questions. And just in terms of the features, however, we do encourage you to select gallery view to make sure we have the panelists enabled on your screen. This program is an outcome of a conversation with many. And to speak a little more about the Miami Center for Architecture and Design, I'm pleased to introduce Cheryl Jacobs, Executive Vice President of AIA Miami and the Miami Center for Architecture and Design. Cheryl, please. Hi there, thanks Oscar. I just wanted to take a minute to thank all of you for tuning in and to thank our panelists and say how excited I am to have the opportunity to uh, partner with the Wolfsonian and MBUS. Uh, we've had great relationships through the years and uh, I, I'm excited to, uh, to have this program. Uh, and with our two, two of our panelists, well, our moderator and one of our panelists are AIA members. So uh, that's always a, a good thing for me. So for those of you that don't know us, uh, Please check us out at uh, MiamiCAD.org and uh, have fun with us. Chad, you're going to be great. Thank you. So yeah. next up is John. Right? Yeah, Cheryl, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Cheryl. Sure. <laughs> this is a, a wonderful partnership. I'm really delighted to be here. And I'm particularly excited about this conversation with Sylvia and Chad. I've known Sylvia for more than a decade and Chad for probably more than two decades. So our relationships are, are, are deep and, um, and, the, and our conversations are always really, really interesting. Whether tonight will be the exception, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> we are, we're, gonna, we're gonna have fun because Chad's book um, is an amazing opportunity to look at architecture in a new way, look at it through this, through this lens of of, uh, of the villain, but really understanding what villains might really be. And of course, when we think of what things are and how they're displayed, we think of the Wolfsonian and Sylvia has made a career of kind of understanding how people persuade uh, others through objects and design and how that um, kind of shapes our world and th those visions shape our world. So. We've asked Chad to put together a few slides and uh, we're excited to be viewing them with you and uh, talking about them as we go along. So Chad, we ask you to maybe introduce uh, yourself if there's anything that I, I forgot sure. because there's a whole world of things I didn't mention about you uh, that are amazing and wonderful. But um, uh, maybe you wanna start uh, by um, talking about this book and how it, how it came about. Yeah, sure, thank you, John. Thank you, Cheryl, Oscar, and Sylvia. Um, I'm really excited to, to be here with you guys. Uh, wish we could be together physically uh, in the real world. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, I have a, a, a really big spot in my heart for, for everything that all you guys do. And I, I, I might be the common thread amongst all of you as I'm a, a member of AIA, a, a fellow. Thank you, Cheryl. And, uh, a member of the board of the MBUS, as well as uh, a past member of the board of, of the Wolfsonian. So uh, I, I kind of uh, covered all my bases. That's why I, I got this great prime time event. Um, but, you know, I really uh, want to take you guys on a, a bit of a journey. Uh, this is a project that, that took about 30 years uh, to create. 
uh, took about 30 people uh, from lawyers to uh, animators uh, like Carlos Fueo, who uh, put together all the incredible animations, to uh, Andrew Gollin, who uh, co-wrote uh, the book with, to uh, many of the people at um, Alona Creative Studio who did all the graphics, as well as, you know, this all could not have happened uh, without uh, my wife, Alona, who just, you know, pushed everything together and, and made it happen. So uh, this is a, a really tremendous effort. There's uh, wonderful contributors and uh, I want to take you a little bit on this journey. Uh, I, I wanted to be an architect uh, since I was eight years old. Uh, my parents actually built a house. I'm actually in that house right now in New Jersey. I uh, drove uh, 2000 miles to join my father for Father's Day and I, first got interested in uh, architecture through the, the design of this house, but also I began to be intrigued by the architecture of movies. So this book is, is sort of an, an homage to the things that have inspired me. And I'll just run a, a, a trailer uh, quickly to, to kind of set the mood. Uh, but we ask ourselves, you know, why do bad guys live in, in great houses? So I, I'll start this. Uh, trailer. of this talk is as exciting as, as the trailer that Carlos Fuego had put together. Um, but, you know, this, this question of why do bad guys live in good houses, I, I think it is really interesting. Uh, my start uh, with being intrigued by the architecture of movie villains started with the man with the golden gun. And uh, James Bond was played by Roger Moore, uh, you know, definitely to my parents chagrin they were big uh sean connery fans and i'm just a roger moore guy because you never forget your first bond but what was fascinating about the villain of scalamandra besides having three nipples was that he actually lived in these rocky out cliffs uh on a, on these islands in thailand so his villa was nestled in to uh these cliff walls and i just thought that was just incredible uh, so this was, was his home base. And, you know, he had an incredible laser gun that was environmentally friendly. It was actually powered by the sun. So, you know, these villains were, were, were quite stylish, quite uh, advanced. Uh, this set was actually done by, and many of the, the Bond films uh, that, that we'll show, by the legendary uh, production designer, Ken Adam. And uh, what's fascinating about Ken Adam is that he actually grew up in Nazi Germany. And a lot of his inspiration was for this architecture that is about propaganda, like big, powerful architecture that's meant to, to impress. Um, another one of the, the films that uh, got me thinking about uh, design and architecture. Can we go back to just that last one? Because that was very cool. 
um, yeah. uh, the ju uh, just one before when because like the the iconic image of the yes that one the cool thing is you just don't see any architecture. I mean, we're talking about monumentality and we've been uh, thinking about how big these guys are in our imagination. But in yeah. fact, he's like crawling, crawled inside that, kind of inside these nature's monuments. And I think, yeah, this, this kind of idea of hiding and being, it is one aspect of kind of the, where the villain lives. Because sometimes villain lives in, villains live in very exposed, you know, yeah. um, surroundings and sometimes they live in you know in glass houses that are completely you know but then here he's like just tucked away which yeah. kind of i think leads to him being part of our subconscious like i don't know what do you think do you yeah no i i agree john and and you know i think it's subconsciously part of, of what we like to do uh as architects which will show a couple of things uh later on where you know for us it's it's about nature and being hidden within nature and a lair, actually the definition, is really a hideout uh, for animals. And, you know, if you don't want to be eaten by your prey, you have to be, have a really good lair, a really hidden uh, experience. So I think, I think you're really right. And that's what I find really powerful about this. It's not about the kind of insertion, but it's about really celebrating the, the beauty and the, the spirit of the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, and the monumentality goes to what, you know, some of the things that the Wilsonian talks about too sometimes with just like, with this idea of, 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 chain, of in this case, it is being the world, but this idea of being, um, you know, uh, uh, being a stand-in for all of, all of civilization, everything in the world, and these kind of like how you bring people around to your way of thinking, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for true. sure. And, and what's really fascinating where I think the message here is, I'm powerful enough to kind of work symbiotically with nature that, you know, it's about kind of, I can take this incredible, uh, you know, nature and domesticize it. Yeah. And I, I think that, that to me yeah. is really, you know, an expression of, of power. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. another, another really interesting um, lair is Atlantis. And I think what makes, many of these villains so interesting is they're utopian in their vision. Uh, Carl Stromberg uh, was born with these like webbed uh, fingers and toes and he always felt more comfortable in the, in the sea. So his idea was that the earth has been corrupted and he wants to create a new, uh, a new civilization of the sea. And what better way to do it than with this incredible uh, Atlantis, um, you know, anthropomorphic, um, you know, submarine base. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really fascinating is the scale of it. While the, this was actually a model, uh, it was about a five foot, um, a five foot uh, diameter model. Uh, the scale of it is really fascinating. So here you can see a helicopter with this dome that, that protects it uh, from the water when this, this um, base submerges. And then this rectangle uh, within the, the, the sphere uh, actually is the interior of his dining room. That's crazy. Hangout area. That is crazy. Yeah. So you kind of get a sense of the scale and, and something that I find so fascinating, which is another demonstration of power uh, is that he is underwater, yet he has a fire, you know, roaring, and it, it's not fake, you know. So, um, but it's it's really a, a very powerful image, and also what Ken Adam was very um, adept in was sort of mixing uh, vernaculars and making environments that are are very brutal and very kind of futuristic feel homey and feel domestic. And, you know, this almost feels like Downton Abbey, but it's in this kind of water spaceship kind of thing that is really fascinating. And from these windows, he can see um, his nemesis is, you know, being devoured by his sharks. So it, uh, not all fun and games. No, it's so interesting that you mentioned Downton Abbey because it, it does, I mean, 
it does reference the source of power, like the historical, that this power just doesn't appear on the planet suddenly. It, it kind of has history in these, in these mansions, in these great houses, in these, and, and so you kind of, by doing this, by putting this, this kind of huge long table ending in a fireplace, but surrounded by these clearly, you know, um, marine grade, if not aquarium windows, is uh, kind of is throwing those right upon, right into one another, so that 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 juxtaposition of the power and where it comes from are kind of, or the, it's not a juxtaposition; it's kind of linked. Yeah, but and there's also can I say something? Oh yeah, please, please do. Please. No, I like the idea that uh, uh, of this interior, which is not modernist at all, and the contrast with the exterior. Uh, which is so organic and also different from the usual production uh, of Canada, who was more like a, a grew up in Germany. And uh, so I think that uh, he, uh, the, um, the location was, uh, the, uh, was Sardinia and the Costa Sardinia. Esmeralda. Yeah. So, and he, he was uh, inspired by a French architect who worked mm -hmm. on the Costa Esmeralda, creating these uh, uh, dwellings, uh, very organic. So it's interesting how he was uh, even inspired by the architecture of the place for uh, a James Bond movie. So, yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. that architecture is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, we have a project we're going to show later where we actually, both uh, us and that architect actually both did projects in the, in the same area. And we've, we've actually met him on, on site in, in Jordan uh, many, many years ago. So oh, it's uh, really fascinating. But mm -hmm. yeah, what was really interesting, and there's a lot of little hidden features that make these places, you know, he has like a gun barrel that runs the 60 feet length of the table and whoever sits at the other end uh, is the target as well as a button underneath where when you take the elevator uh, the floor drops out and you get thrown into the into the shark tank uh, but you know just giving you a, a, a sense of scale uh, and one of the best scenes is when this boat kind of shoots out uh, towards the end I think uh, uh, James Bond might have been on it. But it, another, another uh, kind of expression of manipulating nature and controlling nature, but also being invisible, John, is, uh, is Blowfield's volcano. And at the time, um, this is an existing uh, volcano crater in, in Japan, and the lake opens up, and inside uh, is this incredible uh, environment. Uh, it was actually, you can see it down here on the left. At the time, it was the largest set ever done in the history of movie making. And the budget, I think, was like, you know, it, it's kind of like that scene uh, in uh, The Spy Who Loved Me where it's like $1 million, but it was like $1 million. And at that time, it was the most expensive set that, that was ever done. But that's the actual set. It was not CGI it was built, it's the, you know, the diameter of a football field. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's really a, a spectacular, um, you know, dot, you know, sh display of power. Well, not only power of the villain, but power of the, of the film industry. And I think, you know, to your point, it's the power of the film industry to really shape these dialogues because we're talking about this, um, because it was a film uh, and film had this huge impact on how people thought about what people thought about modernity, what they thought about the future. Like you were saying, like, did they buy into this vision? And, and it's interesting how these visions of cavernous spaces have, um, instead of being womb-like and comforting, for example, they, we might be con conditioned to think of them as being uh, daunting or um, like you were saying, Ex expressions of power. Yeah, I'm gonna have to uh, jump to uh, one image because I just drew an, an association with one of our projects, and I apologize. Go for uh, it. I got I got rid of the image. Ah, oh, I was trying to edit it down for you, and I got. Oh, rid thank of you. It. I see. It. I have a huge <laughs> effect on you. <laughs> oh, I edited the. Oh wrong. wait, oh, you did edit it out. Oh no. Yeah, I, I could find it if uh, we really wanted to. Uh, what know. is it? So maybe people can. No, uh, it's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's a project that we did. Um, whoop. Hello. Let's see. Yeah. Sorry. This is. Uh, let's see. 
I might as well just just bring it in. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I will show it to you in one second. Yeah, this is a um, similar scale space. This is actually a, a like a wellness and research facility in the desert of Qatar. I, I just saw the, the similarity to the scale of it uh, right now, but that was all about uh, diabolical and nefarious plans. Right. And this is all about pleasure and, and well-being. Right. So uh, kind of an interesting uh, juxtaposition yeah, the we, there. Exactly. We can hold those two things in our mind at the same time and, and walk into your space and, and start to get, you know, in really emote, feel the senses of, of, of wellness. But this, maybe it's because there are like men running around in like spacesuits and stuff. I mean, they're, but they're probably men and women running around your space in, in white suits too. So of course, I yeah. I, maybe yeah. our line between pleasure and pain is really not that well defined. <laughs> but it's really fascinating to see this now. And I think like a lot of these, these architectural expressions of like Ken Adams and also some John Lautner homes that are used in the movie that we'll be looking at uh, in a moment. Um, I think they, they kind of played in, in my subconscious because I, I never saw that connection before. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's definitely something there. Uh, what's really fascinating is even someone like Brad Bird, uh, who directed The Incredibles, uh, his lair is actually also in a volcanic um, island. And here, the, the, the villain controls, um, you know, the, the volcano. And he can open and close the lava chutes. Uh, and he has a room where this is like lava th flowing down. Uh, but just the scale of this, I mean, it's, it's, it's very Third Reich. Uh, and what's fascinating about it is the message of the incredible, you know, obviously Pixar films operate at so many different levels. But what's interesting about this is the villain wanted to be a superhero. He didn't have superpowers. So he actually ended up making his invention. He wanted to be Mr. Incredible's sidekick. Mr. Incredible said he didn't need a sidekick. And he ended up creating weapons and selling them to um, you know, governments around the world. But what was fascinating for him was he wanted everyone to be equal. He wanted a world where no one was special. And, you know, that actually sounds to me a lot like socialism and communism, which is, mm -hmm. is really, really fascinating that you, you find these things, uh, you know, even in a Pixar film. But it was also kind of those ideals were at the core of the modern project, you know, in the 20s. And, and I mean, it really were about kind of um, stripping architecture down until it was just what you needed so that everybody would have just what they needed and it would be efficient and connected to the environment. But it quickly became part of our, like came up against our need to collect tchotchkes and stuff like this and kind of like <laughs> clutter our world with stuff, which we do and which Mickey Wilson has probably done more than most people that I know. Um, the king of clutter. The, well, I, I don't know, but he's... Uh, <laughs> No, just that. <laughs> it's a, it's that kind of, it's again another two different sides of our humanness that uh, kind of come together as we try to clean ourselves and our surroundings down to their basics, but also need like the photographs of our grandmothers and mm -hmm. children and all these other things around in our. And yeah, and I think that's what's really interesting, and we're we're going to kind of go into um, some other um, villas was. You know, why, why did the, the, the villain live in such a unique uh, environment? And, and I think that it has something to do with the fact that when these movies were made in the, you know, 70s, more or less, 70s, 80s, you know, most people associated domestic architecture with, you know, traditional type of homes or subdivision homes that were built on traditional uh, styles of architecture. And, you know, the work here of, of Lautner in the Elrod house, which sits above Palm Springs, was just so foreign. And I, I think we have to kind of put ourselves in the, in the mindset of what was happening 
in the 70s. Like, if you wanted to be exposed to architecture that was out of this world, you know, you would have a hard time finding it. I mean, you might have to go to a library and look at an architecture magazine. Uh, you, you might have like architectural digest or architectural record or something like that. But most of that, those houses in architectural digest were actually traditional houses. So this idea of like these incredible environments that are so beyond the normal uh, and offering a new vision of, of domesticity, and many of them of which are in, in, in California, where there was this incredible um, you know, experimentation with domestic architecture. And, and we've been really uh, fortunate enough to actually uh, play in that, uh, in that realm. I, I will kind of... So, uh, and also I can say the use, uh, which is typical in uh, the movies from the 60s and 70s of design objects to create a more futurist uh, environment, like in, uh, in the road house, you can see like the Pierre Paulin and Gaetano Pesce pieces used yeah. like that were completely yeah. unknown at the time they are yeah. uh, now they are icons of design yeah. but at the time they were uh, really strange creatures yeah no it's uh yeah. it's and really then, fascinating and also the idea of bringing the need like that's what i i really yeah, admire nature. about lotner's work you know mm. bringing nature the, the each project is is a love affair with the site this room it's 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 almost like uh, you know, uh, a, a very romantic relationship with the site. And it's kind of interesting because when we built um, m the movie director, Michael Bay's home in Los Angeles, I'll show you briefly here. Um, we were also bringing in elements of the site and pushing the boundaries of, of domesticity and, and this notion of sort of, uh, voyeurism and looking over the site and, and connecting uh, with the beauty. But here you can see also like a rock found on the site that is embedded uh, within the architecture and some really kind of dramatic um, kind of, uh, you know, technical robotics that, that open and close this, this very long uh, window, as well as this hidden underground garage that is very much Bruce Wayne and 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 Batman. So and you know, also yep, diabolic actually. Yeah. So those are the cars yeah. from the the Transformers uh, movie. But here you can see how the the house uh, is very nestled into the landscaping uh, into the into the landscape. We actually you know removed part of the site and then filled it up with the house and then covered uh, the site up again. Um, which I guess would kind of bring us this idea of, of voyeurism um, would bring us to um, this. Wait, can I just wait? Because yeah. you've just brought up a really interesting point, but because we've shifted from villains to villains in films to people who make films who live in houses that are like villains in films, houses. <laughs> and, and I think it's that shift is like super interesting because suddenly when you're talking about Michael Bay, you're talking about a person who creates visions, it, it, this is exactly where we started, where you, the villains are people who create visions that may or may not come true, and these, but they're gonna try. And filmmakers do the same thing, directors do the same thing, and so- Architects way, do the same thing. Are, we do the same things too. Um, uh, almost every craftsman does the same thing, where you start, where if you're making something and producing something, you're imagining it well before you have it held in, you know, held in your hands. Yeah, it's about that, that vision and the, the realization of that vision. And, you know, working with Michael on the house, you know, it was a four, we, a four year exercise. And, you know, it was a really collaborative experience. And we, he had filmed some movies while uh, we were doing the house. So we would go to the set and, you know, to see how a movie is made at that scale, whether you like the films or not, I think Transformers 1 is, is actually a really great, uh, great film. Um, but it's an incredible effort of storytelling. And that's what these buildings are doing. That's what the production designers are doing. They're telling stories. The architecture 
is a very strong character in these films, uh, as well as the messaging and the propaganda that the architecture sets forth in, in mostly in some of the Bond films. But what, what's really interesting here is that in Body Double, Brian De Palma's film, the Chemistry House is actually probably the star of the movie. And uh, it's really a wonderful, a wonderful, I've missed numerous opportunities to go there, uh, one of my Stop. friends lives there. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm still, uh, the last time I went there, uh, Lauren Toshin, I was supposed to be meeting her, the Toshin family of the publishing company, uh, they actually own the house and I was meeting her there and there was a fire uh, where her kids were playing soccer and we, I had to like uh, abort the mission. So I'm uh, looking forward to, uh, to getting back there. Wow. Uh, well, it's, you know, we've kind of come, oh, go ahead, Sylvia, please. No, and the, thinking of the dialogue with nature, like, as you said, this is a kind of not to uh, touch nature. He creates this uh, kind of column and uh, a, this uh, octagonal uh, uh, flying, like looks like a flying saucer uh, above, mm -hmm. above it. So I think it's a great solution for a small uh, lot uh, on a slope now. From, yeah. For an architect, I think it's a, it's a great challenge. Yeah, definitely. It's a great I, solution. Mm. Yeah, this is, uh, interestingly, you bring that up. I, I wasn't planning on all these. This is a project that we're, we're doing on, on the Red Sea, uh, where it's this incredibly pristine reef. The Red Sea has, has the actually most uh, uh, verdant um, uh, life um, in all of the reefs of the world because they've been untouched. Uh, and our idea was to actually build in a very, very delicate way uh, and, you know, build these pods um, in, in a shipyard in Italy, actually, and then uh, bring them in and delicately insert them into a very, very, um, you know, non-invasive uh, foundation that would be drilled into the bed. And the only lo the locations of where these pods are, are actually the only places where there was no life, uh, either on the land or on the reef. So they're in this sort of intertidal zone. And, uh, you know, in, in hearing you speak, Sylvia, about the Chemisphere House, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but, but think a lot about, about that project. But this idea of, of, of nature, um, I think, is really also seen very, or not seen, uh, in the house from, from the movie uh, Ex Machina. Um, and this is one of the most recent films, or the most recent film uh, in, the, in the book that we cover. And what I think is very interesting here is that you know, one could call him a villain. He also had utopian ideas, the idea that we can, he can play God and create an artificial intelligence uh, is, is really a fascinating uh, story. But his lair is almost completely invisible within nature. And it, it kind of nestles in, it, it elevates. And what's fascinating about this, John, which I think is kind of speaking a little bit to your point, is that it's a mixture of built projects in Norway and simulated projects. Right. Um, right. So it's like CGI as well as built. And, and I think that's, that's really quite interesting. But the way that nature and the relationship and the idea of, of kind of controlling nature, but in a very sublime way, uh, is very much demonstrated here in this building. And once again, you can kind of see nature coming in and then the artificial uh, intelligence. Yeah, I mean, I think I was going to say about the other, um, when we were talking about the chemistry house, the way in which the house, it kind of offers that, that last contrast between the, um, the house that's completely submerged and the house that's completely embedded, and then the, the house that's just standing out there. And the idea, it's not only just sitting on the landscape to see all around, um, it's also on a pedestal, raised up on a pedestal a, as almost like a scientific instrument to observe nature. It's like the, like a, a built version of like that ray gun that could, you know, channel the rays of the sun. Mm -hmm. And I, and so I think now that you're going to this um, um, Ex Machina, 
when you go there, you have that country, you have the building set into the landscape. Um, I don't know whether you showed the, um, showed the, uh, yeah, the, the glass house. Yeah. So yeah. the idea that the, there's a glass house there that's set into the landscape, but there's a historic mansion that you see, definitely see there. Um, and you kind of get this, you go back to um, kind of having that dualism between where the, where the money came from to create this, like in the traditional house and then that, the, this kind of new house. So. Yeah, no, it's really fascinating. And also like the, the more domestic areas of, for living are, are elevated and, and more visible where like the secret laboratory and other things are embedded uh, in the earth. So it's a, it's a, it's a really, really yeah. interesting uh, contrast. And I, I love the idea that it was this mixture of movie magic and reality and, yes. and creating something. And, I, and that's, you know, having been on uh, the sets of, of, of many films, um, you know, lucky enough to, to kind of connect with some different movie directors like Michael Mann, who uh, did Miami Vice, which is actually why I came down to Miami in the first place, because I grew up here in New Jersey, where I am. This backdrop is not New Jersey. Uh, but, it, you know, in fact, the, the idea um, behind uh, these films and how to make your vision was really fascinating because I, I saw Michael Mann, he shot a scene in the, in the movie and there's also some really incredible uh, interviews in this book. Um, one of them with Michael Mann uh, that, that is really fascinating. But I, I saw what it took to, he had this vision and he liked to shoot in our house. Um, usually bad things happen in his houses. So someone was murdered in the house and he was spilling like, all this kind of fake blood everywhere, but he actually like reconstructed our kitchen to get like a different angle. And that's like what's happening here. They didn't use the house. They used like pieces of the house and reconstructed it. Mm -hmm. And what's really fascinating is, you know, like Mark Digby who, who did the production design here, there's a great interview with him actually in the book as well. Um, it's fascinating how much depth they give in thinking to the character's architecture and how the architecture reflects the character's sensibility. So, you know, this character has been called sort of Mark Zuckerberg with a six pack. Uh, you could see him here exercising. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he, he definitely has this sort of God complex, which is quite fascinating. But I also think the gendered uh, components here are fascinating too. The fact that the that this, um, the, you know, the uh, machine, what's her name? Uh, yes, that she's, Eve. She, Eva. Eve is in the lair. She's downstairs. And actually nobody knows that she's so much smarter than anybody else in the building, but she's, so in a sense, he's kind of positioning this new future with AI and technology and robots and robotics as something that's both, um, you know, kind of knowable and then, but potentially by setting it architecturally in this space, very modern space of glass. It's almost like he's predicting this this future will be doomed. Um, mm -hmm. But the irony is that she's Eve and that she's, you know, um, she's a woman. And I think how how women uh, um, how, how gender uh, plays a role in these and and the men and, and the women and obviously in this period is, is a, also a, a large topic that has a lot of fascinating kind mm -hmm. of overtones. And what, what's interesting, it's come up on a couple of the discussions about the book is that most of the villains or, or all the villains in, in the book, which wasn't intentional, uh, maybe it, it was subconscious because I think women are perfect, like, and they can't do any wrong, but all the bad guys are, are guys. So, you know, they're all, you know, these these power hungry uh you know you know vision visionaries of evil uh and someone was asked like what why were there no women's layers in there and and only one of the films there was kind of like uh the lion witch in the wardrobe uh, the ice witch mm. that was something that was going to possibly go into one of the it got into like one of the the first rounds of, of the selection but the criteria was for us, it, it was it was very idiosyncratic. It was something that 
was really based on the things that inspired me architecturally. So that was a little bit too kind of um, out there. But the other villain that came up was uh, Demi Moore uh, in like uh, Charlie's Angels 3 or something like that or 2. And it, it just wasn't a great movie, but she was uh, pretty scary not, nevertheless. Uh, but, you know, it, it's very interesting, you know, to take these ideas of, of, of life imitating art and art imitating life. And, and this is probably the most uh, important uh, set design uh, or is known as, as one of the most important set design. It's the war room uh, in Dr. Strangelove. And this was so impactful that, in fact, um, when Ronald Reagan became president, he asked, when they were giving him a tour of the Pentagon, he asked to be taken to the war room. And when they brought him to this little crappy dungeon type of space, he's like, no, no, I want, you got to take me to the war room. And they're like, sir, this is the war room. So he, he was pretty disappointed that uh, it, it wasn't what he had imagined from the film. No, this is an incredible, incredible space that kind of, uh, brings together the like I was thinking about the floors because we haven't really spoken about the floors but in the in Atlanta in the in the Atlantis uh, the floors were like these marble floors that you would see in a palace and these are like almost this liquid floor like yeah. it's it's almost rippling and the and this and the walls are all these screens it's um it's remarkable and I think you can't really see the the there's a lantern over that central table isn't there that's like yeah. incredibly yeah. huge yeah you can see it in drawing like talking Sylvia was talking about yeah the 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 design objects that's that kind of are part of these scenes that make them so enticing and so scary and, and what's so interesting is that these were sort of in Ken Adams' memory of like this Third Reich architecture, this monumental architecture. And, you know, the last um, layer that, that we're going to show, which is probably one of the most famous, is uh, Darth Vader's um, uh, Death Star. And the scale of this, the monumentality, the power, the ability to destroy planets is really ominous and a lot of the the interiors and things are you know also once again this sort of highly reflective you know very powerful uh, moments um and you know I, I think like some of this definitely has a lot to do with you know just jumping down to uh some of the wolfsonian uh thinking but the idea of uh you know from the collection, you know, the, the, the architecture of, of Hitler, uh, as well as Mussolini. But, you know, here, this, this conference room, I mean, Sylvia, maybe you want to speak a little bit about... Yes, I mean, the dimensions are not as big, but this is the conference room of the uh, Brauner's house, which was the first headquarters in uh, Munich of the Nazi party. And uh, you can see the... the um, uh, the interior was designed by Paula Trost, who was the uh, favorite architect of uh, uh, Hitler in the beginning. Then uh, he died in 1934, so uh, uh, Albert Speer replaced him. But this is the idea of the swastika, which is, uh, uh, like becomes the motif of the, uh, of the ceiling and comes back uh, naturally always next to the eagle. And uh, uh, as, you, as we can see, the taste of... Uh, uh, Hitler was more, uh, um, let's say, traditionalist in a way, but uh, the, um, the interior was designed by Trost and uh, his wife. And uh, they designed also the interior of their, uh, of uh, all uh, um, the apartments and houses of Hitler, always with this kind of a traditional, uh, um, yes, uh, flavor. Yeah. But the, the architecture is very strong, like even uh, in this case, uh, which is the house of the uh, German art, uh, we can see these uh, modernized classicism, this rigidity that uh, uh, we see in the big projects of Berlin uh, by Speer. Yeah, I think that's so interesting is that they, they use the power of classical architecture, the orders, the proportion, mm -hmm. but they distill it down 
to its essence and yeah. it's, it's kind of most powerful, right? And the idea of scale, um, you know, Mussolini did, I mean, this looks like a Palladian villa almost, uh, but, you know, in terms of that, that kind of reduction, I think, you know, obviously Casa del Faccio, but, you know, the Palazzo del Civita, uh, Civita is, you know, one of my, I re- I'm, I'm a big, I'm not a big fan of fascism, but I'm a, a huge <laughs> fan of fascist architecture. Uh, I, I, I really love the sense of proportion, the scale. I mean, this building now has been taken over by, by Fendi as their mm-hmm. headquarters, but, uh, you know, I, I, I really, uh, I really have been, you know, I lived in Rome uh, while I was studying up at Cornell for a semester. And, you know, it, I'm, a, I'm a huge uh, fan of the sort of distilled classicism. Mm. And the Romans call it the square Colosseum because naturally there is the re- reference to Roman architecture, but then it's completely modern. And um, yes, and... But it's this idea of kind of using yeah. classical, mm. you know, as a, as a show of power. And it's I, also I simplified it, completely. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's, it's yeah. a gesture. It, yeah. and, and that's what I think the movies use too. Mm. They use architectural gestures to make a large statements and about power and about place and about how we're conquering either the water, the sun, the volcano, wherever it is. Like, but it has to be a, a gesture. You can't look at somebody's messy bedroom and think of like the future. Maybe it's, yeah. it has to be big and, and bold. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. You say you can't look at someone's messy bedroom because w- one of the comments that came up in one of our, our, our talks was like, you never see any, any, you know, any cleaning supplies out or anything out of place. You know, there must be really great storage in the exactly. desk. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but I guess lawyers have, have to have good storage. <laughs> yeah, they, they uh, actually. W- I took this this course one summer with uh, the the late Massimo uh, Vignelli, who uh, was like sort of the founder of like modern graphic design, industrial design, and I became friendly with him. And I know he was a a, a big friend of the of the Wilsonian as well, um, especially Kathy Lev. And, you know, he had, he had told me like, you know, how you live in these minimal environments is you need incredible storage. So he had this office, which was so minimal. There was like a pen on the desk and it was just this like temple. And you open up, he opened up this wall and it was like this whole messy office in the side and in this hidden wall. So I, I think your point, John, is, uh, is very true. Did you find that in your, in your experience with uh, Michael Bay? Did you find, uh, did you have to do amazing uh, calisthenics to hide the stuff? You know, it's interesting. Uh, Michael was uh, less concerned about storage. We kept trying to add more and more closets and stuff. And he wasn't married at the time. He's not married now either. But he, he said that he wanted to design a house when he wasn't married so that it could be exactly what he wanted and he didn't have to listen uh, exactly to uh, someone else to give their opinions on, wow. on his vision. That's husband material. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, he was, uh, so that, that meant like not a tremendous closet, uh, but a really beautiful closet, uh, in fact. But, you know, the, I, you know, just, these incredible images, you know, the, the, the sort of use or the appropriation, if you will, of classical architecture, I, I find really fascinating. Um, you know, Terrani. But, but uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but oh, for please. example, uh, Terrani, I mean, is, is classical because he uses uh, like the, the square. It's like uh, there is uh, also a kind of symmetry, not really because actually in this case, there is not symmetry because on the wall, there should have been the screening of the Duce. Uh, but uh, um, he, he, in this uh, case, he answers to um, Mussolini's uh, sentence, which was uh, fascism is a glass house. That is a trans- like a transparency of the government. And then he transposed it in architecture using marble, but then with the, using a lot of uh, uh, glass, uh, uh, well, naturally, like glass uh, surfaces and the glass blocks. Uh, so, mm-hmm. and uh, I think w- what's interesting also of a fascist architecture compared to 
um, Nazi architecture that it has a, like a dichotomy between more modernist architecture and more classicist. Yeah, definitely. So I think that's definitely. a very interesting uh, thing. If you see also the interior compared to uh, like the conference uh, uh, hall uh, in uh, in the brown house, uh, so this is uh -huh. much more modern with the tubular uh, furniture and. Uh, yeah, it's much more Italian, much more chic, much more, you know, like very sexy where, you know, the German is a little bit more, more rigid. Uh, but, you know, I, I think like certainly this, this work by Tarani has been so influential uh, to, to so much of, of modern architecture. Uh, and, and I think what's interesting is that I'm seeing it now when you're saying there should have been like a big poster of El Duque here is that it's almost like the New World Symphony where you're in the, the, the piazza and you're, you know, there's images here to be seen or, or, or wall casts, if you will. Uh, you know, it, it has almost like a similar proportion and, and orientation as uh, the New World Symphony, which I don't think Gary was probably thinking about at the time. I was gonna yeah, I see if, uh, if Oscar, because we're down to the, the final minutes, I was wondering if, if Oscar had uh, seen any uh, questions in the yeah. chat. Um, yeah, I, I, just uh, before, I, I thought Sylvia, this, this was so interesting, which you, mm. you brought out of the collection. Maybe you wanted to, to kind yeah, of- Yeah, just uh, thinking of uh, James Bond movies and Atlantis, this uh, Yves Flotin, like this floating island, which was uh, um, envisioned by a French architect, Henri de France, as a, uh, gas station for uh, uh, the uh, airplanes during the transatlantic uh, uh, voyage in 1928. So it was a reinforced concrete uh, stuck, uh, structure with a hangar for the, uh, the airplanes, uh, with a restaurant and a hotel. And so it's a great project. And we have all this series of the drawings at the Wilsonian. And uh, it was a project that in the 1930s was not necessary anymore because uh, they were able to do the transatlantic uh, uh, bo uh, trip without uh, stopping. Yeah, so I thought this was really yeah, it's a great really beautiful. Project. Yeah. Uh, With the airplane. And then, of course. Uh, yeah, and then this curiosity was about Goldfinger, what well, uh, the Olympic. But, mm. Yeah, and then, of course, you know, the power of, of uh, the Nazi architecture. There was, you know, this great desire to dominate sports and 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 through that and uh what i found also was that hitler was planning this huge auditorium uh very sort of roman if you will like circus maximus but it was supposed to be the largest um auditorium or stadium in the world it's supposed to hold four hundred thousand people and it was actually partially uh completed uh before uh, the end of the war but, you know, I think this bunker architecture really inspired Ken Adam. Uh, you know, it, it was probably embedded in his psyche, but, you know, certainly this, this brutalist architecture of concrete. Uh, and then, you know, I, I think much of this messaging of architecture of propaganda certainly goes back to the ancient architecture where the leaders were, were, were showing their their power, uh, not only on the battlefield, uh, but also in, in civic and, and palace architecture, you know, from Greece, um, sorry, uh, from Rome, uh, Egypt, and, and the Aztec uh, as well, um, you know, in, in this part of the world. Uh, and certainly the church um, speaking a lot about, about messaging, about architecture of influence, uh, and and basically the, the the search for light and knowledge and enlightenment uh, was, was kind of how how um, religious architecture uh, transcribed and you know we we can't forget the the, the influence of uh, the Russian uh, Stalin Lenin the constructivists um, you know and these incredible buildings uh, that were not built but interestingly enough. Zaha Hadid actually built uh, her only residential project for a, a Russian oligarch who actually lives in Miami, his other house on Star Island, uh, very similar to, uh, and I, I think, John, correct me, I mean, I think the constructivists were, were very influential to Zaha 
Um, of course, of course. Yeah, she was. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, I think Chad, you have now launched, officially launched into our, our, our full semester long seminar on uh, <laughs> architecture and monumentality. And I know it can go on. We have 15 weeks to uh, go. We only have five minutes uh, here tonight you together. Go. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to say you've just introduced so many interesting kind of topics. And uh, I think it's a perfect way to end on your, well, on your book uh, that has a, if you, you get a 30% off on, on, on the book. On the whole and, site, you guys, special promo, promo from Tra Publishing, 30 percent off on all books uh, what's the site you go to the trapublishing.com as it is yeah. on the screen local um, publishing company and uh in miami so yeah no i i think this was i mean my mind is just exploding between the bunkers and the layers and what the difference is mm -hmm. and i mean i think you did a brilliant job at kind of both uh synthesizing things and pulling things together, but also exploding kind of the way we think about things, the way we think about nature and the landscape and architecture and space and the human condition, past, present, and future, um, both individually and also as a collective, because you're talking about, on the one hand, a layer for a bachelor, and on the other hand, <laughs> an entirely new world. I mean, we got to the un new universe. So um, and I think, uh, Sylvia, you did absolutely an amazing job at kind of pulling in those kind of the attention to detail and the way in which details matter. We look at details. We look at details on each other. We look at design and how design at every scale impacts who uh, impacts how we perceive um, space. So um, I, I'm going to I've been I'm going to have to I think we're going to really have to wrap it up. But if you want to yeah. make some final Final comments, Sylvia? Uh, um, I think there are some questions. Uh, well, we will not have time for questions at this point because the, the uh, webinar uh, okay. will end exactly at, uh, <laughs> at eight o'clock. So uh, if you would like Save to have some questions, via so email. Sylvia, yes. If you want to put up your email no. chat, you can uh, answer questions. <laughs> I don't even Sylvia, know how to put up an email. Sylvia, you can, uh, do you want to make uh, any closing statements? No, I would just... Like, um, was this? No, I was just checking the questions because uh, maybe we should. We did not have time uh, to do them. Uh, okay. Uh, sadly, I've been told uh, so, that that's the case. All right, and I'm sorry. sorry to everybody. So who, I'm just. Uh, I wanted just to tell the story of Goldfinger because I think it's a curiosity from the Wilsonian that we have a, a sideboard designed by Erno Goldfinger, who was uh, the architect that inspired uh, uh, the name of the villain in uh, the famous. Uh, Goldfinger movie and uh, so Ian, Fle uh, Ian Fleming, the, the writer of the novel, uh, knew this modernist architect who was not a very well, uh, uh, I mean, uh, not a great fame because uh, he um, uh, demolished a group of uh, houses in, uh, in a uh, Georgian neighborhood in London and uh, uh, built his own house, which is now a masterpiece of uh, uh, modernist architecture, but at the time was not really appreciated. So uh, Jan Fleming uh, took, uh, like named uh, his villain after uh, um, uh, Goldfinger. And we have a beautiful piece at the Woodsonian from the 1930s, uh, which is uh, like uh, um, connected to, to James Bond in somehow. Great. Well, thank you all. I don't want to, take any more time but uh no it's been great get it's dropped off but thank you sylvia thank you john well, thank, thank you thank you Cheryl, everyone it was thank really you, everybody fun. i put my yeah. email if you guys want to send I, me anything and i put it in the chat to all the attendees okay, so if you guys check the chat you'll see the um uh, chad's uh email great well thank you everyone thank you thank you bye bye bye, bye. have a good evening <laughs>